Hi, I'm Pastor Mike from Good Hope Church. I'm glad you've tuned in today with us. I appreciate you being here. We're in part three and our last uh, installment of our series called Vision. And it's our vision series for fall of 2018 and talking about our vision statement for the church, our purpose for being. And then this week we'll be dealing with a few specific strategies. There's other things that we're doing as a church, but this is basically the, the fundamental main point of what we're here for. So I hope you get something out of Vision Part 3, Reach Out. We are now, nah, we're going to do our series, but first we got to do our one minute blessing. That's why I have notes because I get confused in the middle of things. But our uh, one minute blessing, we pray together as a church. Every service we pray together. Why do we pray together? Because when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God. You know, God set it up that way. I'm not sure why He set it up that way, but that's what He has decided is best is that when we pray, He responds. And so we pray together because we want to see the hand of God move. And today, uh, as we're in the reach out part of our sermon series and the Feed My Starving Children thing happened the last couple days, and we've got God's work our hand, this a- God's work our hands this afternoon, uh, it's all about people coming together and serving the Lord together. So let's pray for volunteers and for people who are stepping up and serving the Lord in a variety of different ways, but let's also hit a specific a uh, specific prayer for volunteers that are on the prayer team, our prayer teams, both the teams that pray up in the front and uh, the ones that pray over needs that are put on the secret prayer team Facebook page and that sort of thing, as well as people who are just signing up to, to fast and pray in our October month of prayer and fasting. Our church started in 2010 in October, and so we kind of take that month to pray over the next year. There's a prayer guide up there. If you want to fast and pray one of the days in October, we want to get every day filled, so we've got people praying and fasting through the whole month of October. I'll be starting that up. Uh, I'll be heading out to the pastor's prayer and fasting retreat, first three days in October, so I'll be there uh, coming back on, on October 3rd on that Wednesday. Uh, but I'll start off praying and fasting those days, and, and there's, you can sign up more than one person on the same day. So whatever day works for you uh, is something I, I really appreciate, because again, when, when God's people pray, it moves the hand of God. So let's pray together for encouragement for volunteers, because sometimes it's fun and exciting, and other times it feels like nothing's getting accomplished. So we need to pray encouragement for the volunteers, and also let's pray for our prayer teams and for the prayer and fasting month. So Uh, Join with me if you would, and let's pray together. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending workers in your harvest field. You said in your your scripture to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers, because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Thank you, Lord, that we've seen hundreds of workers just this weekend step up and do mighty things for your kingdom. So we pray blessings over all people who are volunteering and serving you in so many different ways. We pray encouragement over them that they would just, uh, that they would know that they're making a real difference, even when it doesn't seem like that, but that you would just bring encouragement to their hearts. And Father, we lift up those who are involved in prayer ministry. Father, for the intercessors, some are homebound, but they pray from home. Lord, for prayer teams that pray for people up in the front of the church. And Lord, for those who are part of the prayer and fasting month of October. And Lord, for those who are praying all over the world, who that's their ministry, is a ministry of prayer. Lord, we pray encouragement and strength to overcome the enemy's attacks, but that they would just stay fervent in prayer. And Lord, that you would bring blessings upon them and just help them to be filled with joy as they know they're making a difference for people and for your kingdom. So Lord, bless our people of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right. So we are finishing our series on vision, our Reach Up, Rise Up, Reach Out vision series. And next week, we will have Pastor Corey from Morgan Park here. He's going to be preaching and, and uh, sharing a good word from the scriptures and also talking quite a bit about how the last year has gone in Morgan Park. So today is their one-year anniversary 
They are done with church now because uh, they start at 10 and their service should be over. So they're likely eating cake as we speak. It's at least getting set up, you know, like I was going to try to sneak over there, but I'm not going to have time to go get some cake from Morgan Park. Maybe I'll get some somewhere else, but I just love cake. It's a happy thing. <laughs> And they're eating cake right now, celebrating one year. They had a a big flood in their building this past week with that big rainstorm. Whenever rain goes sideways, that building fills with water. So that's a little iffy. Uh, It's nice to rent, you know. But the the problem is it got all moldy and smelly and stuff. So they've been cleaning that out all week, trying to get it in good shape for this morning. Uh, But I think everything went well. And anytime something goes crazy like that, you know what I think? I think God's got a good plan. You know, if something bad's going to happen to mess up the plan, it's got to be a pretty good plan. So we got to be filled with faith and expect God to do something great. So that's what's going on in Morgan Park. Pastor Corey will be here next week. It's going to be really good. And I'll be in Morgan Park so we can kind of keep that relationship going strong. And, and it's really a, uh, it's a, a fantastic thing that's going on there. You'll hear all about that next week. But this week we finish our vision series. It's a series that we get to do hand motions with. So in Big People Church, we do hand motions for the vision series, and there's a specific reason why we do hand motions, and that's because it's a silly thing that doesn't make any difference, and if we can do that together, then maybe God will trust us to do things that do make a difference together. But if we can't work together on something that doesn't matter, like doing hand motions, if that's too far for us to go, then what's God going to be able to trust us with? Not a whole lot. Because we're going to be just resisting and resisting and resisting. What we need to do is work together, stand together for the kingdom of God. And so we do hand motions to the vision statement. And uh, the last two services, we didn't have to do it twice. We just did it once. So the last two weeks, we've done it twice. But this time, I think we can do it once. And so if you know the hand motions, you can do them with me. If you don't, you'll catch on real quick. So here's how it goes. So the first one is reach up, where we reach up to God You know, this is our first experience with crying out to God, or it's our maintaining our experience and abiding in the vine, reaching up to God. A real relationship with the living God is available to you. And then the second one is rise up. This means that a real relationship with the living God will change you. It will help us to rise up out of the junk that's been hindering our lives and into the good things God has for us. And then the third one is reach out. And this is a real relationship with the living God is a call to action. We're called to do things and to serve the Lord in powerful ways. So thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. Now God will give us more important things to do. Uh, So again, just by way of recap, reach up. That's the connecting with God thing. And this is... Uh, This is true for the insider and for the person on the outside. Two weeks ago, we talked about different people's experience with God, and we talked about Samuel and how he was dedicated to service to the Lord from birth, and he slept next to the Ark of the Covenant, and he became a great prophet, and he had all the advantages. And then we talked about the Canaanite woman who was rejected and pushed aside and had all of the disadvantages. And both of them had a wonderful relationship with the Lord. She fought through adversity and got her miracle from the Lord. And Samuel served God diligently. And that's true for all of us. If we're somebody that's been raised in the church and things have been handed to us and we're just carrying the baton, then hallelujah for that. But if we've had to fight through all kinds of adversity and we feel like we don't belong, uh, the truth is that Jesus has died for you and you do belong. You are part of the kingdom and you can have that relationship with the Lord as well. Last week we talked about rising up, that a real relationship with the living God will change you. And this is how we get better is by our lives changing. You know, the outside doesn't change first. We change on the inside first, and then the outside changes. And so this is the process of discipleship. It's the process of sanctification. It's getting good at being a Christian. There's nothing that I see as a more frustrating existence than being a Christian who's bad at being a Christian. It's a frustrating life, and it makes other people think that you're foolish, and they don't 
want to connect with God because they see that it's not working for you anyway. And it, so why would you want to live a frustrating, miserable life that doesn't help the kingdom of God? Uh, let's rise up. Let's get good at this. It's a great life, and it makes a real difference. Last week, we talked about Jesus' process of helping people rise up. We looked at the life of Peter and the basically four things that Jesus did in those days to make disciples. The first thing was he called them. He said, come and follow me. And there were people that said, all right, and they left everything, went to follow Jesus, and there were people who said, no, that's all right, and they didn't go with Jesus, but he called, some answered, then he taught them, he gave them instruction verbally, he led them by example, and he even taught them through the, the miracles of God to show God's power. Then he gave them opportunities to serve in a controlled, safe environment. The example we used with Peter was when Peter walked on water. And he began to sink, and so Jesus catches them and picks them back up and brings them into the boat. He doesn't just let them sink and go, oh, you of little faith, you know, like, see what happens to those people? And he goes back to the 11 and says, you better have more. No, he catches him and picks him up and brings him back into the boat. He got opportunities to learn through practice and, and being involved. And then Jesus released them. And again, with Peter on the day of Pentecost, he preaches in Jerusalem. 3,000 people get saved. He straightens out all the confusion that was going on there. And the, the church age is born in power through the preaching of this Peter who sank and who didn't feel like he belonged in the presence of God at you know three years before. That's the process. And that's what we want to have experience with us. When God calls, we say yes. And then we learn and we... We practice and then we are released into greater things. This week we talk about reaching out. This is that final step of discipleship. A real relationship with the living God is a call to action. So let's pray and we'll get into this new material here this morning. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, you knew that that the Bible would be mistreated and misused and misunderstood, but you gave it to us anyway. So thank you, Lord, for that. But we want to see your truth for what it is. We want to understand and see, and we, we don't want to uh, have anything be distorted from your word. So, Father, I pray that you would guide us by your spirit to be able to see uh, what your word has for each one of us. Lord, I know that we're all dealing with different things and we need, a, we need a different answer from you. We need a different bit of encouragement. We need a different miracle from you. But Lord, you're well able to do that for each of us personally. And so Lord, I pray that you would do that as we look into your word. So bless our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A real relationship with the living God is a call to action. So how many people think that the world is just fine the way it is? pretty much good, you know, like socially things are fine, politically things are fine, you know, as far as poverty around the world, things are fine, as far as disease, things are fine, education systems are fine throughout the world, everything's pretty much fine, everybody, you think everything's fine? Like, no, I never hear people say that, you know, you go to the coffee shop and the old men are talking, they're never like, yeah, everything's great. You know, I think everything's pretty much good. You know, they don't, they're not saying that. They're, they're, they're noticing the problems in the world, and they're, they're talking about those things. But here's the deal. As Christians, we're not called to be thermometers. We're called to be thermostats. What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? A thermometer can tell the temperature, but can't do anything about it. A thermostat can tell the temperature and change the temperature. Too many Christians are thermometers. They look at the world, oh yeah, this world's messed up. And that's the end of it. Well, big deal. We're called to be thermostats. Wow, there's a lot of need out there. There's a lot of difficulty out there. There's a lot of pain out there. Let's go do something. Let's change that. A real relationship with the living God is a call to action. We're called to make a difference. We're called to... Look at this world with all its pain and all its trouble and all its separation from God and bring people to God, bring people into abundant life and help people get free. We're to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. 
So we are called to action. And I've got a simple plan. And then we're going to talk about a more complex process. But here's my plan. I think I like to make things as simple as possible. So for believers in Jesus, here's what I want you to do. Step one, quit wrecking stuff. Okay? (laughs) Don't wreck your family. Don't wreck your church. Don't wreck your friends. Don't wreck your relationship with God. Quit wrecking stuff. Step two, start fixing stuff. (laughs) Start fixing your family. Start, Start being a blessing to your friends. Start making a difference in your church. And as you serve God, start fixing some things. Look at it. There's plenty of broken stuff. Don't be part of breaking stuff. Be part of fixing stuff. Get enough people fixing stuff, and all of a sudden, this world will start getting better. The temperature will start to change. We're going to look at some scriptures this morning and uh, try to, to take some things out of these. The first scripture is a scripture that is highly motivating for me. I hear people, you know, I don't hear it that much anymore. Maybe it's the circles I run in. But years ago, people used to say things like, you know, Christi- Christianity is boring and irrelevant. I think, what? It's, it's certainly not boring, and it's certainly not irrelevant. Like, we're, we are in the epic battle between good and evil. We're trying to fight the darkness with the light of Christ, and we can see victories and we see defeats. And as we struggle and fight, I've never been bored. And I tell you what, I've seen God do amazing things. It's not irrelevant, it's exciting and life-changing. It's fantastic. Now, I got saved in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, and then I got to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And I don't like Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You know, are there things in the Bible you don't like? Basically, I've devoted my life to try to make these scriptures not true. All right? Let's look and see what we got. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus is speaking and he says this to the crowds. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Jesus is saying that for most people. Their life is painful, their life seems pointless, and it ends bad. But what's available to us is a life of joy, of overcoming, of strength, of making a real difference in this world that ends with everlasting life in the paradise of God. Now, I like the second one. But Jesus describes it as the narrow road that only a few find. And I believe that life that Jesus is talking about is is two parts. It's going to heaven for sure, but it's also abundant life now. We're not called to have a miserable life and then go to heaven. You know, some service of the Lord is hard. But you know you have a purpose and it's meaningful. And you can fight through those difficulties for the greater purpose and it's worth it have you ever done something hard that was worth it it's not about the comfort level it's about how worth it it is so we can serve God and it's worth it and it's wonderful and the end is uh is everlasting life so we can have abundant life now in all the different things that that means and have everlasting life later That's what Jesus is saying is the narrow road that only a few people find. Is there work for us to do? Yeah, step one, find the narrow road. You know what I mean? Find the narrow road for your marriage. Find the narrow road for your your, uh, professional life. Find the narrow road in your relationship with Jesus and your service to the Lord. Find the narrow road in that. And then help other people get on that road because too many people are suffering, too many people are hurting, too many people are in pain, and too many people are lost. I find these verses very motivating. 
And I believe Jesus was trying to make this not true as well. If we go back to verse 13, we can see what Jesus says. He says, enter through the narrow gate. This is a warning. He's, just, he's trying to get people out of the wide road onto the narrow one. And that's what we do too. And there's plenty of work to be done. Even though Jesus said that 2,000 years ago, it's not like we've gotten it figured out. Do you think now, well, well, yeah, you know, we've got all the information, so pretty much everybody's on the narrow road now. Is that how that's working? No, we've got pain and addiction and, and hurting and people lost and depressed and, and they can't find the Lord and there's all this going on and that's here in America. Imagine other parts of the world where there's so many more things coming against people. There's more work to be done. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, oh, I should get an update. This narrow road thing. We want to call people into a relationship with Jesus. Through this series, each time we've done the good old-fashioned Billy Graham, every head bowed, every eye closed, and let's raise your hand, that sort of thing. So far, through this week, uh, through this series, three weeks, we've had 60 hands. 60. Yeah. Amen for that. You know? And we'll have that opportunity again at the end of this service. But I tell you what, if we, if we call people, some respond. Let's keep calling people. But we also want to help people into abundant life. Not just everlasting life, but abundant life. And one of the ways that we can help people into abundant life is through ministries of love and compassion like Feed My Starving Children. You know, at the, uh, in Jamaica, they have a Bible school about five miles away from the children's home. And when we were at the Bible school, because it burned down, we helped rebuild the Bible school, the students there who have no money... We're eating Feed My Starving Children manna packs. So this is feeding Bible school students who have no resources. And now, what do you think they're going to do five and ten years down the road? They're going to be serving God and making a difference in their nation. And that's helping them to be able to get through. So this helps people. We try to make life better and empower people. It's part of the deal. All right. There's work to be done. And I'm going to tell you something, and I want to see if it hits your heart in a a funny way. God wants you to be great. Do you know that? God wants you to be great. He doesn't want you to be pushed down and, you know, think you're just a piece of garbage that can't do anything. God wants you to be great, but he wants you to understand what greatness is. Let's look at uh, James and John and their request of Jesus with the help of their mother in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. This is one of my favorite pieces of scripture because it's hilarious, but it's also very painful Because the problem that was happening here is also something that continues to this day. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, so this is the mother of James and John of the twelve. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. So when you're on your throne in heavenly glory, could you make another throne for James and another one for John and just put them right next to you? Wouldn't that be good? (laughs) Now, she very likely thought this was the cabinet of the, uh, uh, the government that would be set up on earth. She wasn't understanding what was going on. But either way, they're sneaking in and they're, they're trying to get ahead of the other disciples by talking to Jesus off on the side. And James and John's mother apparently is the catalyst of this. So, 
Because you know, there was dysfunctional stuff going on back then too. It's not a new thing. People are people. Verse 22, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. So this is a profound understatement. You don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. They didn't know what they were saying then either. And this is a chilling response from Jesus. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. He's saying, there's going to be some things you're going to go through. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. So the other ten of the twelve disciples are like, what did you do? You went to talk to Jesus to get in front of us? I mean, he's going to make his decisions. Don't try to lobby for better places than us. And they're all upset. So they're having this big staff crisis. So Jesus calls a special staff meeting because, you know, this is an important time in history. He's going to go to the cross pretty soon, and the disciples are fighting with each other. So he's got to call a special meeting. Verse 25, Jesus called them together, and he told them something. Now, I want us to look at what he said, but also what Jesus didn't say. How did he help them in this situation? Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. So he's saying, being the top dog in this world is one way. There's winning in this world, and a lot of times it's by pushing other people out of the way and getting in front of them. It's about having power over people and exploiting your advantage and winning. He said, that's the world's way. Verse 26, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. What he didn't say is don't try to be great. What he did say was, you want to be great? Great. Here's how you be great. You don't become great by pushing people around. You don't become great by getting everything for yourself. That's not how you become great in the kingdom of God. You want to be great? Learn to serve. Go ahead and be great. Be a great servant. Let's continue. Verse 27, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. You want to be at the top, then you got to be a powerful servant. Verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus came not to be served. He is the person who walked on this earth who was most worthy of being served. And he came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom, not to be served, but to serve. So Jesus calls us to be great, but he calls us to be great servants. He calls us to be great blessings in this world. He calls us to make a great difference for the benefit of other people. That's how he wants us to be great. So, there are two kinds of great things done for the kingdom of God. There are great things done for the kingdom of God that are noticed, and there are great things done for the kingdom of God that are not noticed. Which category has more things in it? Which category is greater? It's the one where it's not noticed. Amen? There are some people that get to stand up in front of the group and talk, and that's noticed. And there are people who serve the Lord in powerful, wonderful ways, and no one but maybe two or three people know. And there's no big party. Nobody has an appreciation month for them. (laughs) There's nothing. But the Lord seeing it 
and that person wanting to be a great servant. That's most of it. Let's be great. Let's serve God powerfully. Let's be a great blessing. One more verse of Scripture, and we'll talk about some specific things. In John chapter 14, verse 12, I encourage you to read the whole chapter. We're going to take this one verse. I don't think it's a verse that's easy to take out of context, so it's, it's fine to read just one here. Jesus is speaking again, and he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. So Jesus is saying, if you put your faith in me, you'll do what I've been doing. What was Jesus doing? He was loving people. He was, he was accused of being a friend of sinners, of caring about people who didn't understand how to serve God and live their lives right. He was accused of being a friend of sinners. He loved people. He loved people on the outside. He ministered healing and deliverance and provision for people. He made a difference and he taught the ways of God and Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater thing, things than these because I am going to the Father. So Jesus says, the people that put their faith in me will do greater things than I have done. Does that strike you as possible? <laughs> you know, Jesus fed the 5,000. This weekend, Feed My Starving Children did 100,000. Just right here. 100 and what? 101,000. That's right. More than 100,000. So, plus women and children. Uh, <laughs> so here, and that's just here. Look at this. Definitely with regards to quantity. There are millions of people... Serving God all around the world. There are more than 5,000 people being fed by believers around the world right now. If just in Cloquet, there's 101,000 meals prepared this weekend. This is happening all over the world. Millions of people are being uh, blessed in various different ways. There are people praying healing over other people in the name of Jesus all around the world. It's happening in every country. Sometimes with the, the sign up front, sometimes hidden in different homes, but there are people seeking God and seeing the blessings of God come in millions and millions of people all around the world today. Much more is being done because the message has spread over the world. Now, there are still places where that message needs to be shared and the love of God needs to hit and the blessings of God need to come in. And we've only got so much time before this thing is over. We've got a world that's straying from God. We've got an enemy, an adversary that wants to stop us. And we've only got so much time. Jesus is coming back. And for some people, today is their day anyway. There's people leaving this planet every day. And so for some, it doesn't matter when Jesus is coming back. Today's their day. And so we need to get this love of God into the world because we face opposition and we've got limited time. I remember when I first got saved reading about how with, if you had this bad mark of the beast thing, you could buy or sell, but if you didn't have it, you couldn't buy or sell. And I thought, how is that even practically possible? You stop people from buying and selling? It was a cash world back then. Now... Well, it could happen today. It could happen today where you can't buy and sell. There's places don't take cash anymore. These prophecies that didn't even make sense as to how they were even possible, now we can see it. We've got a limited time. We've got to get the work done. Greater things than these. That's amazing. Jesus wants us to be great and to do greater things. 
Now, I don't think we can do greater quality, but we can do greater quantity. <laughs> Amen. We can't pray more effectively, but we can pray in the power of God in in the same way that Jesus did. We can be a blessing to others in the same way. Let's look at some practical things we're doing as a church. And then we'll, we'll finish up with just some good time of prayer at the end. But we want to make a difference. We want our lives to count for something. We want to reach out. That happens through organized church things, and that happens through individuals. Organized church-wise, like we we saw the New Vision video about the the kids and what's been going on there. The child sponsorship program has taken them from in desperate need to being financially stable. However, the problem is they are still dependent on us. And that's an issue. If they're dependent on us and something goes wrong there, then they're back in the situation they were in before. And that's been the great missionary error, is not being able to establish independent, strong ministries, but they create dependent ministries. And it's good. It's good for fundraising when you say, oh no, the kids are starving, give a bunch of money, and then people feel good. And it's not quite as exciting when everything's going great, and we need way more money so that we can have them be even greater. You know, it's, it's not as easy to motivate people to give in that situation, but unless we can do that, we're going to be stuck in a dependency situation. And and here's what's going on. So they were in a bad spot. Now we got the child sponsorship program. The home is open. It's flourishing. They're able to buy their school supplies and have all the basic needs that they have, but they're still dependent on us. And the good news is, is the children's home is located on 30 good acres of farmland. You see people chopping with picks on that stuff. That heavy clay grows yams like you wouldn't believe. You know, around here, we'd be thinking like, oh, that's some harsh stuff, but it grows yams. And they've got 20 acres that could be fully developed into yam production. And if that got uh, all the way going to its fullness, it would pay all the wages of the farmers and all of the child sponsorship money would also be matched by the farm income. So they would no longer be dependent on us. They would be self-sustaining for the duration. Now, isn't that way better? In order to do that, uh, I had a, a guy from church come up to me. He says, look, I think I got it figured out. I'm like, well, let's hear it. Because a lot of people tell me things. And I'm like, eh. but here's what he said. He said, you know, we sponsor children. Let's sponsor farmers. Because what's going on is that the home can't take a bunch of money from the kids and put it into paying farmers that a year from now they might get a return on. They've got to take care of the kids. It's wrong to have the orphanage pay for a farm. It's got to go the other way. But then you can't invest in it and get free. So you're stuck in a, in a trap. But here's the deal. Uh, a full-time farmer in Jamaica is $300 a month American. That's above minimum wage. It's a nice salary, $300 a month. If we can have three to four farmers that we sponsor for 18 to 24 months, that will be enough time to be able to produce the financial return that will then cause them to be able to become financially independent. It will create jobs. It will show how this is possible. And it will allow them to not be dependent but be independent. And then they can be a blessing and we can be a blessing somewhere else to another forgotten place around the world because there's more forgotten places than there are places that are getting help. And so wouldn't that be something? We've already got the person who came up with the idea said, I'll sponsor the first farmer. And so we need two or three more. $300 a month, sponsors a farmer. It's an 18 to 24 month commitment. And you can do, you know, like you can do a little bit of one or whatever. It doesn't matter. But if we can get that done, then they can be on the road to independence. And they won't need us. Hallelujah for that. Then we can help somebody else. And that can repeat itself. We got Morgan Park. I'm going to go over again. I worked so hard. I felt like I was doing well. It's okay. You guys don't like football? I like football. I'm highly motivated to be out of here. All right. (laughs) All right. 
Morgan Park. So this is the one-year anniversary of our campus church in Morgan Park. Here's the deal with that. Man, there's so many small communities, rural areas, small churches that are fantastic and doing great work, or the need is tremendous, but the resources are very small. I pastored for 10 years in a little bitty community in a church that we started that was little bitty church, and here's what happens in little bitty church, is you have to be the preacher, you're the worship leader, you're the youth director, you have to watch all the kids' things, you're the maintenance man, you write all the policies and procedures, you've got to figure out the financial reports and and do all that stuff. Basically, uh, you, you are everything all the time. You clean the church. You do everything. And you have another job, usually full-time. How does that work? It's a tough one. So here's the deal. With our campus model, we see the tremendous need and the tremendous opportunity in these small communities where pastors oftentimes have to work another job. Well, let's create a network of churches that works together so that we can help train and equip local ministers to be able to reach their communities and provide for them the policies and procedures, the bylaws, do the website for them, put the financial reports together, take care of the basic structure and vision and free them up to not have to do all of that stuff but just minister to their community. And if they need to have a second job, a part-time job, they can have that inside the network. So for example, if somebody is a maintenance man and they can do maintenance here and at this location and that location and be a campus pastor over here, then they can get half their salary from doing maintenance at all the facilities and half their salary from the other church. And that way they don't have to take vacation time to go to trainings. And we can get some work done. Amen? Amen? And one thing I really love about the state of Christianity in America today is if you do something well, a thousand people will copy you. If we get this thing working and it produces fruit, it's going to be people copying it all over the place. Amen? Amen? Amen. Same thing with that new vision deal. Let's get people copying us. That's how we'll have tremendous impact and can change more than we ever thought. Boy, there's a bunch of other stuff. So there's church things, and there's a lot of other church things going on, uh, and then there's individual people doing stuff. You know, Feed My Starving Children wasn't a Good Hope event. It was a person from Good Hope who had something on their heart from God, and we cheered them on and connected them with the ministerial alliance. You know, yeah, amen. There's reach out stuff that happens inside the church and there's reach out stuff that happens outside the church through individuals stepping up into their calling and there's also things that are partnerships you know like with uh, kingdom builders for the Wood City Music Festival and the Wood City Worship Nights partnering with Young Life there's people uh, there's empty tummies I don't know, there's a little box out there you can put box tops in over there so there's a lady from church who was a, a teacher and she saw that kids would come to school without having eaten breakfast and there's no food for them and they can't uh, they can't eat at the cafeteria and so they're trying to do school but they haven't eaten they're having trouble concentrating and she's like this is a problem let's get snacks for these kids and so you just collect box tops you put them in there and they collected 900 box tops this summer and now super one is jumping in they're donating uh stuff for this project and every month they're making a donation and it's a way to just make a difference that was just the on the heart of a particular individual and they stepped up and started doing it it's not a church thing it's an individual person stepping out in what they've been called to do god has plans for each of us and we can do great things for the lord And don't shy away from being great in the kingdom of God, being a great servant, being a great blessing, making a great difference for other people. I'm going to invite the prayer teams up. We're going to close here momentarily. I promised I'd get done on time. We're told to do what Jesus did, and Jesus came to serve. Matthew 20 26 through 28 again, let's read this. It's what we read earlier. This is how Jesus told his disciples that would become apostles how to be great. He says, don't don't do it like the world does. Don't, Don't be a bully. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. 
Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served. The King of kings and Lord of lords came to wash feet. He came to give His life. And He calls us to have the same heart. Now we can't die as a sacrifice for sins. But we can live for Christ and give our lives in service to His kingdom to benefit others. Now, I don't believe there's such a thing as a stagnant Christian. I think there's Christians who are growing and there's Christians who are falling back. I don't believe that you can be stagnant. You've got to have your foot on the gas if you're going to be growing. You take your foot off the gas, you start to fall back. God's calling us to be growing and to be making a difference because we've got a limited time. We've got work that needs to be done and too much of it is going undone. So we need to We need to reach up and connect with God and abide in the vine and stay connected with the Lord. And we need to get better and learn to be a greater servant of the Lord and to make a a greater impact as we reach out into this world and bring good things from God into it and call people into everlasting life. So I want to pray for us along all three of these lines. And then I'll invite people up for personal prayer as we close. Prayer teams are here. They're ready to go. We've prayed that God would do great things up in the front. If you feel on your heart you need some prayer or you'd like some prayer, come up and let's believe God. We're going to pray together first, and I want to do the same thing where I give you an opportunity to raise your hand. So let's pray. Let's believe God to connect with Him, to be growing in our faith, and to be making a difference. So bow your heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are so good. Lord, your plan is so good. Thank you that you put us here for a reason and that we get to fight a battle that's worth fighting. Sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes it's difficult and hard. But Lord, it's always worth it because your plan is good. And we just just love you, Lord. And Father, right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to give people an opportunity. If you've never said, yes, Lord, I'm in. I want to serve you. Please forgive me of my sins and help me walk in your ways. If you've never done that, or if you've been slipping back and you need to say, yes, Lord, I'm in all over again. If that's you, with every head bowed, I want you to raise your hand. God will see your hand. Just lift up that hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, you can put your hands down. Lord, we just we just pray mighty blessings over the ten people that put their hands up. Lord, you know who they are and you know their situation. And Lord, you saw that. So Lord, let your spirit be upon them. Let them learn your ways and Grow in your ways just in amazing power. And Lord, help all of us to be growing in you. Help all of us to be taking today's step today. Lord, we can't grow five years worth in one day, but we can, we can take today's step today. Lord, let us each do that and not fade away. And Father as you put things on our hearts and as you give us opportunities, let us answer the call and be a great blessing in this world. Let us bring your love to people who are lonely. Let us bring prayer and your hand into situations that are desperate. Lord, let us bring help into situations where people have needs. And Lord, let us teach people to be self-sufficient and empowered themselves so that they can also be a blessing to others. Lord, thank you for your great plan. 
Help us to walk in it. Encourage us. Give us strength. And let us be a bright light for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that was our third sermon in this series of vision for fall 2018 here at Good Hope. And the the topic is of reaching out, that a real relationship with the living God is a call to action. We're called to make a difference. We're called to a life of purpose. We're called to have significance in what we do. Now, one of the things that I've seen people get confused on with that is they think, you know, if I'm going to really give my life to the Lord, I either have to become a pastor or move to Africa and become a missionary. There's lots and lots of ways to serve God. One of the questions that I got about this sermon that I would like to answer is, what are some specific ways that I can reach out? So for the, for the person who isn't moving to Africa and who isn't becoming a pastor, how do I reach out? And the reality is there's a lots and lots of ways to make a real difference. And I do want to just be sure to clarify, you can be in the complete will of God and keep your job and just go to church and not have to move to Africa Some people God calls to do that, and if He's calling you to do that, go ahead and do it. Don't hesitate. If He's calling you into pastoral ministry, go ahead and do that. But for most people, God doesn't call them into that uh, type of ministry. He calls people into serving in the church in a volunteer capacity. He calls people to help out in the church in different ways, and then just to be a light for Christ in the world. So let me just talk about some of those options. So as far as working in the church in specific ways and reaching out, it can be working in the nursery or or with kids. It can be doing church cleaning. There can be a small group that you lead or help facilitate or you open up your home for somebody else to lead a small group. You can be serving in any of the ministries of, of a, a church that you attend. You know, there's ushering, and we've got a coffee person, and, and just people like that. Just serving in all those different areas are ways to reach out. Then there's the unorganized ways of reaching out inside the church setting. Things like... Uh, Just saying hi to somebody and being an encouragement to them, just uh, knowing their name and loving them and paying attention to them, it's a big deal when somebody knows who you are and cares. It's one of the things that we're missing in our society is that connection between people that used to be just automatic, but now through technology, we're, we're just more separated from people on that deeper level. And so when people know who you are and they care, boy, it makes a big difference. And so if we can express God's love to people just by saying hi, knowing their name, uh, even helping them out with something that we find out that they need, that can be a huge deal. And of course, that extends outside the four walls of the church, uh, you know, to where you love your neighbor. You can help in any particular way, just anything that helps out. You can do babysitting for somebody or Uh, help them clean up their yard, or again, just know their name and care about what's going on. That brings love into this world. And if you share the truth of God and the heart of God with people, it makes it so powerful and meaningful. And I want to, uh, to say that As far as churches are concerned, there's lots of different churches in our communities that are doing lots of different things. And in order to reach out to our whole community, we need a bunch of different churches doing different things. Here at Good Hope in Cloquet and in Morgan Park, you know, we do things a particular way. We've got, I think, fairly loud music, though not as loud as the coolest of churches. And we've got some, some things going on with, with some larger groups and that sort of a thing. But there's also some wonderful smaller churches that are doing fantastic things for the Lord and creating nice, beautiful, tight-knit communities. If you're someone who's interested in attending a church that's a, a, a beautiful, tight-knit, uh, smaller community, 
I would encourage you to check out Westminster Presbyterian Church in the Smithville community of West Duluth. Uh, Pastor Carolyn there is a, a real go-getter, and they've got a great group of older people that really love each other and want to embrace more people in their congregation. So I'd encourage you to go check them out if you have the opportunity, if you live in that area, or you want to be part of a church like that, check out Westminster Press. Because all the churches need to work together to reach out to our world, and we can all meet different needs. So I'm, I encourage you very much to find a church that you fit in and you can serve the Lord in and you can reach out through. Well, that was the conclusion of our sermon series on vision. And we talked about reaching out and some of the reasons for that from the scriptures. And then a few questions and some specifics on what that might look like. So understand that you do have a purpose in Christ. There are things that God has asked you to do. First is to develop into the person that he created you to be. And second is to do some particular things to help people out and to make a difference in this world. So I encourage you to connect with God, to grow in your faith, and to truly make a real difference. 